Last week we, we finished looking at that lengthy central section of the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 10, verse 25, which is an exposition on the high priesthood of Christ. So we got, we got through that and we're now in the fourth and final uh, interjection of exhortation. You know, remember the, the way the, the, the writer, he, it's a sermon basically, and he interjects these, these sections of exhortation in his exposition. And we're in the fourth and final section of that, which is a lengthy one that runs from chapter 10, verse 26, through chapter 13, verse 19. And this, this lengthy section of exhortation, it opens with a warning about the danger of rejecting God's truth and God's Son. And the writer says in 10, chapter 10 of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 26 through 31, that a Christian who turns his back on God and walks in impenitence, that he will be condemned to hell. Now, I know how that sounds in our society and culture to say something that pointedly, but it's the truth. You see? And so he tells them that he's warning them that because he is exhorting them and we need to exhort one another. You've got to tell people the truth. You know, if they're heading down the road and the bridge is out and they're going to go off the cliff, it is not a loving thing to do to him and haw about it. You've got to tell them. Okay, so he's, he's exhorting them and, t- and telling them that. By rejecting Christ, which is implicit in being devoted to sin, okay? One, one who is devoted to sin has rejected Christ, but in doing that, one rejects the only sacrifice that exists for sin. If you reject Christ... As your sacrifice for sin, you're in a world of hurt because he is the only sacrifice for sin. So if you're going to do that, as I mentioned that comment from Wesley, well, I hope, hope, sir, that you never sin (laughs) because you have no sacrifice for sin. And you know that that's not going to happen if you've been paying attention to your own life and heart. You know you sin and will sin. So if you've rejected Christ, uh, no sacrifice for sin is left. In chapter 10, verse 32 through 39, the writer encourages them to remain faithful under pressure. Now, remember the circumstance. They're facing pressure. As we face pressure, they have a different kind of pressure. They're having a, the pressure from the, the, uh, their Jewish heritage. Their, uh, you know, the Jewish community is ostracizing them. There is a concern about uh, persecution from the state. If we've reconstructed this correctly, we're on the verge of Nero's persecution. So there's a lot of bad stuff in the wind for Christians. So they're tempted to return to some form of Judaism. And so he's telling them here, he says, look, listen, he wants them to remain faithful under that pressure by calling them to remember their past commitment. That earlier time of hardship they had endured after they received the gospel. He tells them to think back to that time. How you had stood, how you stood so strong. See, in earlier years, they had, among other things, accepted with joy the confiscation of their property. And I tried to drive that home to, to, you know, realize that these are real people. When we, when we study the Bible, sometimes we think of them as, as literary characters. But they're real people who experienced the confiscation of their property in the name of Jesus Christ. And I just ask us to think about that how we would handle that and could we accept that with joy because our property had been taken because of our faith in Christ. And it's an an important thing. And as, As Guthrie said, he said, this manner in which they accepted the theft of their properties describes a spiritual condition by which one sees and celebrates greater realities than those immediately observable. The hearers had joy in the midst of their persecution because they knew that better and lasting possessions were promised them by virtue of their identification with the Lord and His church. What allowed them to be joyful in the confiscation of their property was this conviction that there is a truth here and that faithfulness to Christ carries a reward that transcends whatever punishment and hardship I am experiencing in the present. Okay? It is the right move to hold to Christ. And so they had that conviction. And that's the thing that I harp on that we really have to instill in people. And part of it, I think, is bleeding out is our culture has become so uh, atheistic uh, that, that people, it is hard for people to maintain a genuine conviction that this is the truth. 
You know, it's easy to sit here and say, this is a thing we get together and say, and nudge, nudge, and wink, wink. But to really be convinced, this is the truth. Okay, well, that is where, you know, that's where devoted living and a willingness to suffer comes from. It emanates from a conviction that God is real, Jesus is real, Jesus is in heaven ministering. Okay, so that's the thing, see, that, and that's what he wants them, and he's, he's telling them, think back to that time, because he's strengthening them, he's using that to strengthen them in the here and now. And he also urges them to remain faithful by reminding them that if they do, they'll receive the promised blessings of salvation, whereas if, if on the other hand, they abandon Christ, they'll face condemnation. See, whatever hardships they in faithfulness endure will pale into insignificance in light of the eternal glory that is the reward of the faithful. So he's urging them, look, I know you're under pressure, I know it's difficult, and I think that's what we need to do with people. Yes, I understand there are pressures, but you need to hold fast. Okay, now in chapter 11, he turns in chapter 11, he presents the positive example of faithful people in history. Okay, remember he, he, what he's doing. He wants them, he's encouraging them. I want you to hold. You're under pressure, but hold. And he's now going to point to them, point, point out to them some of the, the heroes of faith in history. And that's where I want to look right now. He says in chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, he says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by this the elders were commended. By faith, we understand the universe to have been created by the word of God so that what is seen did not come into being from visible things. Faith is described here as a confidence in things hoped for, a confidence in the fulfillment of God's purposes, God's promises, okay? A confidence in things hoped for, that I have this assurance, this confidence that God's promises will be fulfilled okay an assurance a confidence in things hoped for and a conviction of things not seen a conviction about spiritual realities and about the future where you sit here and say listen i know this is true i know this is true in my inner being okay these spiritual realities uh the future that has been promised i know these things are true and it was for lives lived in such confidence and conviction that the Old Testament saints were commended. That's why they were honored. That's why they were commended, because they lived lives in this kind of confidence and conviction. Faith being a conviction of things not seen, that idea is illustrated in the case of the creation of the universe. See, it's through faith and not sight that they understand that God, through His Word, created the universe from nothing. And you see, this to me is one of the spear points in our culture where we are constantly told, implied, suggested, on and on, that the idea that God created, that He is the one behind the creation, He actually did it, well, that, that's silly. You see? If you haven't tuned into that and you haven't seen that, it is everywhere. It's in all the movies, television programs. It is constant. That the idea of a creator, that he is the one, that's wrong. That we came from nowhere out of nothing by chance with a quantum fluctuation 13.7 billion years ago, and the rest is history. Everything just shook out from that through natural processes. And you look and say, that sounds crazy. I'm telling you, that is the creation myth of Western culture. I'm telling you, that's it. And I spent some time some weeks ago maybe months ago, you know how that is, time flies when you're having fun. But I spent some time explaining and showing this is the creation story of Western culture. And, but they do it, see, the people, you know, well, we scientists, you know, we believe this. Well, not all of them do, of course, but the establishment, those, the, the cultural power, science with a big S, that's its story, and it's preaching that story nonstop. Well, here you have, you know, right from the get-go, he says, look, you know, he says, by faith we understand the universe has been created by the word of God so that what's seen didn't come, out, come into being from visible things. God created. Okay, he created everything. All right, now, now that's something, as I say, that our society tries to undermine, and that's part, I'm convinced, part of the difficulty we have with people in our culture. 
You didn't grow up, some of you didn't grow up in, in a society like this that was so uh, overtly atheistic. And you have a hard time understanding why some people who've been more immersed in this later culture, why do they have difficulty really internalizing some of these things? But it's because of the socialization they've received through our society that this is crazy. That, you know, we all know the, how this happened. The truth of the matter is God created, and it's an important thing, and we have to teach people that. Okay, and sometimes that involves engaging science. Okay, sometimes it requires that to show, no, wait a minute, you see. Uh, data is one thing, and interpretation of data is another. Okay, so we can look at data and say, you know, I understand that based on what God has revealed and that kind of thing. All right, so he, but this is, this is an overture to these heroes of faith that he's going to present. And then he says in chapter 11, verse 7, 4 through 7, he says, By faith, Abel offered a greater sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as being righteous, God commending his gifts, and by it, by his faith, he still speaks, though having died. By faith, Enoch was taken up so as not to see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For before he was taken up, he was commended as having been pleasing to God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For it is necessary for the one who approaches God to believe that he exists and is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, having been warned about things not yet seen, was reverent and built the ark for the salvation of his house, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that is according to faith. So he's now giving some illustration. He says it was, by, it was faith that motivated Abel to offer a better sacrifice than did Cain. It presumably motivated him to offer the best of what he had. Okay, so we have here that, that Abel by faith offers the best of what he had, offered a better sacrifice than Cain, and through that faith he was commended by God as being righteous, through God's acceptance of his sacrifice. That was God's commendation of him. Okay, so he was commended by God as being righteous, and though he was killed by Cain, in reaction to his demonstration or expression of faith, right? That's what happened. Cain killed Abel, but he was killed as, an, as a result of his expression of faith. He continues to bear witness to the power of faith in an unseen God. He's going back and recounting his story right now. He continues to testify to the power of faith, even though he's long been dead. Okay, so he wants them to, he, he's telling them about faith because they are being pulled, and he's saying to them, hold on. Faith, faith, conviction, assurance, hold it. Hold it. This world is trying to shake you. This world is trying to frighten you. This world is trying to kick you off, Jesus Christ. And you hold on to that thing like a mad dog. You hold it. And he's trying to say, look at these guys. Okay, look at these guys. Okay, he says, by faith, Enoch was taken out of this world without experiencing death. You see that in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. And though the Genesis text, it doesn't really speak of Enoch's faith, you see in chapter 5, verse 22, and chapter 5, verse 24 of Genesis, it says that he walked with God. Okay, that he walked with God, which, which implies that commendation, see, that implies that he brought pleasure to God. And the fact he brought pleasure to God testifies to his faith, because as in the Habakkuk text, which he just quoted in chapter 10, verse 38, he quotes the Septuagint version. But because in that Habakkuk text, right, he, he makes clear that God has no pleasure in those who shrink back, who do not exhibit faith. So Enoch walked with God, which means he brought pleasure to God, and you can deduce from that that he had faith, because God takes no pleasure in those who shrink back, who don't have faith. And then he says in, in verse 6, he declares, without faith it's impossible to please God. Okay, one must have conviction that God exists and he rewards those who seek him. So he's saying, listen, Enoch is another example. Enoch was taken up, but it was, it was, he's commended because of his faith. He walked with God. He pleased God. And so we can see in that that he was a person of faith. And then he says, by faith. So first he talks about, he speaks of Abel, he speaks of Enoch. And then he says, by faith, Noah acted reverently. When he was warned about a future flood and he built an ark to save his family, God tells him, I'm going to do something. 
I got something coming. Hey, what are you going to do with that? You either say, okay, God revealed that to me, I believe it, and I'm going to act on it. Okay, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to construct an ark. And people will be going, what are you doing, man? <laughs> I'm building an ark because God has promised he's going to judge the world. And as a footnote, let me say, I know that we, you know, periodically there are movies that are made that are kind of comedies and cutesy about uh, Noah. This let me remind you that Noah, this is an act of horrific judgment on the world. Okay, it is an act of judgment. It is not really cutesy. It is God's wrath on the planet. And everybody but eight people died. I mean, this is a serious, serious judgment. Okay, so, you know, this is, I, may, I may be over hypersensitive to these kinds of things. I may even be paranoid. But when I see, uh, you know, I see, I don't trust Hollywood as far as I can spit. Okay, let me just tell you that. Because I see, the, I see the operation there in the most part as being contrary to God and doing everything possible to undermine the truth of God. So if I see something coming out here, I'm, I'm immediately thinking of, you know, what's the angle? Okay, what's the angle and how does it undermine something? But anyway, he, he says, look, by faith, Noah reverently, he's warned in, about a future flood, he builds an ark. And his faith-based conduct, his obedience to what God has said is coming in the future. His faith-based conduct, that stood as a testimony against the world's unbelief. It was a contrast to the world's unbelief, and thus it served as a demonstration of the propriety of the world's condemnation. Okay, so here he is, he's exposing, demonstrating, contrasting his faithful obedience to the world's unbelief, and in that act, he shows the propriety of the world's condemnation. And the world was condemned. But he's going back and he's saying, look at what it is. It is faith, faith, faith. Don't turn from it. Don't turn from it, okay? Noah inherited righteousness in connection with faith. Now, what I think he means here, I think he's talking about he inherited in the sense his faith produced righteous living. Righteous living flowed from his conviction of the truth of God. Because when you look in Genesis 6, 22 through 7, 1, you see the emphasis is on he obeyed God completely. He obeyed God completely. He did what God said. Did what God said. So I think the emphasis here is on a practical righteousness that flowed from his faith. And that's what he's urging these folks to do. Then he says in verse 8 through 12 of chapter 11, he says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place uh, which he was destined to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he migrated to the land of promise, a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, the fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, the designer and builder of which is God. By faith, he received power for the sowing of seed even though beyond the time of age. And Sarah herself was barren, because he considered faithful the one who promised. Therefore, also from this one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as the stars of heaven in number and as the innumerable sand along the shore of the sea. Okay, by faith, Abraham obeyed God's call when he was called to move to a place with which he was completely unfamiliar. And you think about that, you know, what will you do when God calls you? What will you do in obedience to God? Well, he calls him and he says, go over here, all right. I'm going to uproot, I'm going to go to a place that I'm a, I don't know anything, anybody. And the world was a lot different then, you know. It wasn't so small with all this communication and all this kind of stuff. You just get up and go, it would be like going to Pluto or something. Get up and go. And so he, in faith, he, he, he obeys God's call, he goes there, and, and though that land remained for him only a promised land, okay, for him it was only a promised land, not a land over which actual possession had been secured, he endured living there as a nomad. Okay, living there as a nomad, living as a tent dweller between the time of promise and the time of fulfillment because his eyes were set on a city of true permanence, an eternal city built by God. It was that faith, that conviction, that hope that empowered him, that caused him. When God said go, he says, I go because I'm looking somewhere else. And that's how we're to be. 
That's how these people are to be. That's why he's citing this. See, he's saying, I know you're being tugged. I know you're being pulled. That's how it works. But hold to the faith. Look at these examples of people. And by faith, Abraham was enabled to do what naturally was impossible. Okay, naturally was impossible to father a child at a very advanced age. He trusted God to fulfill his promise that he would give him a child through Sarah. Okay, and as a result, uh, and as a result, a multitude of descendants, he trusted that, that God would do that. Now, I follow the NIV, the NRSV, and there's some other translations in thinking that the subject of verse 11 is Abraham. Okay, there are other translations that take Sarah as the subject of verse 11. Okay, so if you see that and you're confused and you're saying, what's wrong with this crazy person? Okay, look at the NIV, NRSV, and some others, and you'll see. Uh, I think this makes more sense. I go with this, and with a number of commentators also. Okay, I think Abraham is the subject. Okay, that he's talking about the faith of Abraham, but his point is, he says, look, he, he, he had faith, he went where he was called to go, and by that faith also he was enabled to do what naturally would have been impossible. Okay, so he's, he's telling them, he's stressing to them the faith of, of people in the past that you need to look to. Then he says in, in verse 13, he says, in conformity with faith, I mean, they were still abiding in faith, all of these died not having received the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having acknowledged that they are strangers and sojourners on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed of them to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Okay, he, he's urging them, look, focus on the example of the people. Though Abraham saw the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise to bless him, to multiply and bless his offspring, and to bless all nations through his offspring. He saw the beginning of the fulfillment. We talked about that in the discussion about Hebrews chapter 6, verse 15. He saw the beginning of the fulfillment of that in the birth and preservation of Isaac, in Isaac's marriage to Rebekah, and in, in his sojourning in Canaan. Yes, he saw the beginning of the fulfillment, but he, Isaac, and Jacob, they all died prior to the actual possession of the promised land, prior to the actual multitude of descendants, and prior to the actual blessing of all nations. They died before the complete fulfillment of those things, and it's only together with the saints of the new covenant that they will arrive at God's ultimate goal. Okay, th these things were still future, they were still to be fulfilled, yet they lived with faith in the complete fulfillment of those promises, and that's what he wants them to see. These guys are getting the hammer. They're getting stressed, and so are you, and people in our day are under stress and difficulty and hardship, and he says these people live between the time of promise and fulfillment. Okay, and they were driven by their trust in the fulfillment to be faithful in this time of difficulty, in this time of promise, you and I are looking forward to something. Okay, and this is a difficult time. We are in the time of promise, waiting the fulfillment. And it is just as they were. Okay, so he's calling them to this. Their perception of themselves as aliens and sojourners or strangers on earth. And you can see in a number of places in the Old Testament that perception that they had. It was because their focus and longing was on God himself and his city. Okay, you see that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, that same concept. That's where they were looking. That's what was motivating them. Okay, yes, they were here active, living in this world, but their heart and eyes were set on the fulfillment, on the promise. And so this is how they're, they're acting, and he says, this is how we need to be. You have to have this conviction that God is true. That His promises are going to be fulfilled. And through that, you then live in this world in light of what you know to be true. And this is the example, and this is what they're doing. See, because God and, and life with Him was their deepest commitment. Their highest priority. God is not ashamed, He says, to be called their God, as evidenced by the fact He's prepared a heavenly city for them. Well, I want that said about me. You want that said about you. 
That God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why is he ashamed? Because they're holding fast to what he said. God says, listen, I'm going to flood the world, build an ark. He builds the ark. People say, what, are you crazy? Why are you living here, laboring like this? Why are you doing Because I trust in something you don't see. I trust in God and his word and his promise, and I'm going to order my life by it. See, that's what faith is. You know, I have, I have well, not only me, I, there's just no room for this idea. Yeah, I believe that's true, but then I live like it's not. Well, what is that? If you live like it's not, you don't believe it's true. You know, I, I'll tell you a story when I, you know, I repeat myself all the time because I only have so many stories. Uh, <laughs> but the good news is, is the older I get, the less I can remember what I've said. But uh, when I became a Christian... Uh, you know, kind of a tense time in our marriage because, uh, you know, Meg, it was like somebody had stolen the irreligious man she had married. It was like crazy. You know, here's this guy here. He's reading the Bible and all this. So we had friends. I'd, I'd call them and talk to them and tell them about Jesus. And uh, some of them thought I'd lost my mind. And they would get on the phone with Meg and console her that her husband had gone crazy. But uh, this is true. But I was talking to this one guy, and, you know, he was friends of mine in school, and he and I used to hang out, stone, drink, do all that stuff, you know, so I knew who he was. I mean, you know, he couldn't fool me about who he was. So I was telling him, I said, no, I've come to believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he sat there and he said to me, yeah, 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 this is, this is almost the quote, yeah, yeah, no, I believe it died, rose on the third day, whole nine yards. And I said, don't tell me you believe that. I said, you can't believe that. You see, but he was willing to say he believed it. But he lived like he didn't care about it at all. He lived just the way I did when I admitted I didn't believe it. You see, this idea of faith and this conviction is when you come to see that's true, these things can't be separated. They can't be pulled apart. And so this idea, there is a reality to faith that flows out in life. Let me read to you what Guthrie says. He says, the message to the original hearers must not be missed, for their circumstance must be seen as analogous to that of the patriarchs. Perhaps their current experience of persecution has highlighted the alien nature of their earthly existence. And I sometimes wonder if the church has not gotten complacent in part because it lacks any kind of persecution. It is so easy to just bop in, nod, smile, and split to make this the Rotary Club. You see, instead of something that is much deeper and fuller than that, Instead of something that is more analogous to, as I said last week, a revolution where there is this passion and this commitment to the cause. Okay, I just think that that may be a part of what's, what's happening, but that may change. All right, picking back up, he says, they cannot perceive the fulfillment of God's promises to them. Okay, they're getting the hammer, they're getting pressured. They know these promises out there, but they're living in the here and now. That's the way we live. Difficulty, suffering, hardship. But you got this thing out here, this promise and this hope. He says all they can see is the difficulty of their present crisis. The writer's point is that this is normal for people of faith. The promises of God must be embraced even though their fulfillment lies in the future. Life must be lived in our challenging terrestrial cities in light of a better heavenly country that will be experienced in the future. God is not ashamed of identifying with those who live in this way. That's how we're to live. You know, will our lives not be radically different from the world if we genuinely believe the truth of God's promises that this isn't all there is? Amen. That we're not simply worm food? That there is something bigger at play here? I just How can it not be? How can it not be that we will not then... We will be different. You would see in the body of Christ, you'd say, well, these people are different. Why is it? They're different because they have faith and conviction in the reality of God and what he's promised. And this is what he's urging them. He wants them to hold on to that. 17 to, uh, 11, 17 through 22. I kind of busted this up. It really runs down through uh, 31, but sometimes I just got to piecemeal some things. He says, by faith, Abraham, when being tested offered Isaac. Indeed, the one who received the promises was offering his only son about whom it was said, through Isaac your seed will be called. He reckoned that God is able even to raise someone from the dead, from which he also in a figure received him back. By faith, Isaac, also regarding things to come, blessed Jacob and Esau. 
By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave instructions regarding his bones. Okay, Abraham had such faith in God that he was willing to obey God's command to sacrifice Isaac, the very heir through whom God said the promises would be fulfilled. Now think about that. God says, listen, I'm, I'm going to fulfill these promises. I'm going to fulfill them through Isaac. Now, go kill Isaac. Just, just ignore the idea first, the idea of killing your son. Go kill Isaac. And he sits here and he says, okay, you know, you know the story, he's ready to kill him. Why? Because God said it. People mock that idea. God said it. You're going to do anything God says? I hope so. <laughs> Don't you hope so? God says go do this. If God says go do it, he's going to do it. Now, why is, what's he thinking, okay? What's he thinking about? Well he, well, he trusted that even Isaac's death wouldn't prevent God from fulfilling his promises through him. Now, that's some trust in God, isn't it? You say, oh, no, 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 if I kill him, that's it for God. God has now met the ultimate foe. Death has defeated God. I got news for you. Death doesn't defeat God. That's the message of the resurrection. It is not a power that defeats God. And so Abraham says, all right, I'll kill him. He's the promised heir. God will raise him back to life. Now, is that trust? Can you imagine sitting here and putting your kid to death? trusting that God is going to raise him up because God has promised that he would be the heir. Well, you can see why he's citing this. Because you got people here who are saying, well, I think I'm going to turn and go back. And he says, hold! you got to hold! It's the truth! See, it's not this, this thing where we're just sitting here, okay, right? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, Jesus, resurrection. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the truth! And I know I've told many times the story of the kids at the funeral. Child dies, they're all there at the funeral, little boy says to his parents, Mommy, the, the, the dead boy's ch parents, he said, they believe in the resurrection, don't they? She said, well, Johnny, we all believe in the resurrection. He said, no, they really believe it. They really believe it. Because they don't grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Okay, who have no hope. We grieve at death, but not like the rest of people. Death is still an enemy, but we grieve not like the rest of people. Because the day is coming, okay? The day is coming. But he says, look, Abraham had that kind of faith. And as an old man, Isaac, like Abraham, he trusted God's control of the future, okay? He trusted that God was controlling the future. And in that faith, he blessed Jacob and Esau regarding the future. Now, Esau didn't receive the covenant blessing, okay? The blessing of being in the covenant lineage, being the child of promise, he didn't receive that. On the contrary, he sold that right to Jacob. Okay, you know the story. He sold that right for a bowl of stew, and he was unable to inherit that right despite crying aloud for it, as the Hebrew writer is going to mention in chapter 12, verse 15 to 17. He did, however, in Genesis chapter 27, verse 40, he received a blessing of sorts regarding the future. Isaac told him in response to his plea for a blessing in 27, 38, that though he would serve his brother Jacob, the brother of the covenant promise, he would at some point break his yoke from his neck. See, he gave him something. Now, to bestow even this somewhat backhanded blessing regarding the future is to express faith in the God of the future. You see, if I'm going to speak of something that is going to be done to you down the road, I am expressing faith in the God who controls this place. And so even though he gives him something of, somewhat of a, of a backhanded blessing, he still in that exercised faith in the God who controls the future. Now, Jacob, he continued the pattern of being faithful throughout life. Jacob, then he blesses Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He blesses them from his deathbed. And you see in, in Genesis 48, 8 through 22. Now the statement here in, in Hebrews that he worshipped on top of his staff this refers to an earlier incident in Genesis 47, 29 through 31. And it's an interesting thing. The word staff, okay, the Hebrew word, it means just the consonants 
They're the same consonants in bed and staff. Okay, so it's not, in other words, Hebrew, they don't, originally they don't put any vowels in there. It's not until the Masoretes, centuries later, that the text was vowel pointed. So you can see, if you've ever seen some writing like that where the vowels are left out, you understand what it is, and that's how they did it. So those same consonants, the word means either bed or staff, depending on what vowels are plugged in. Okay, well, the Septuagint took it to mean, to mean staff. Okay, and that's how he's, he's taking it. So the word staff there, he then says he worships leaning on his staff. Okay, the Masoretic text, the way it's typically translated these days, would be bed. Okay, but it's the same consonants. All right, and the, the Septuagint says, no, it's, it, it should be pointed to mean staff. And that's what the Hebrew writer under inspiration takes. And he says that he, that he wound up, he says, uh, leaning on his staff. Okay, and in, in that incident in 47, 29 through 31, Jacob, he bows in worship after Joseph swore to carry his body out of Egypt. Do you see the faith there? The faith in what? In a future? The faith in something that God has promised? Jacob's request, it looks forward to what? To God's deliverance from Egypt. If you're asking somebody, listen, when God brings you out of here, take my bones with you. Well, what are you expressing? You're expressing, I know what's coming. I know that God's going to do this. Okay, well, I'm telling you, I know what's coming. Okay, I know what God is going to do. And so he's telling them, listen, you have to live in that faith, that conviction. It must transform your life. Don't be shaken off by these, you know, this mirage of the immediate. Keep your eyes fixed on this, just as these people are doing. Jacob's request, he looks for that deliverance, as does Joseph's request in the next verse. Joseph, at the end of his life, he expressed his continuing faith in God when he gave instruction about the relocation of his bones in connection with Israel's future uh, exodus from Egypt. Guthrie says here, uh, it, uh, says of verses 20 and 22, he says, In each of these events, death confronted the person of faith who spoke of things that were as yet unseen. Isn't that where you and I live? Right? And aren't you shaken? Isn't that sometimes when you know, you know the fear? Uh, but he says, listen, there is this truth. There is this promise. There is this revelation of God. These men acted on that. I want you to look to them and draw strength and see what this is about. Okay, I've got to bust this one up here too. I'll read two of them and then... I'll read two and then flip back to this one. He says in 23, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing instead to be mistreated with the people of God than to have the temporary pleasure of sin, considering the reproach of the Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the anger of the king, for he persevered as seeing the invisible one. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that the one destroying the firstborn would not touch them. By faith, they went through the Red Sea as, as through dry land, regarding which, when the Egyptians made an attempt, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after being encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, having welcomed the spies with peace. Now, we ought to be back to the, to the first one. Okay, it was, it was by faith in God's purpose for their child Okay, which purpose they perceive now from something about the child's appearance that was taken as a sign of God's favor? Okay, we don't really understand that, but this is what he says by faith when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful. Okay, this is the idea there was something about his appearance that they perceived as a sign of God's favor, and because of that they hid him despite the risk of doing so. See, his parents, they were motivated by faith in light of some kind of spiritual insight into the significance of Moses. And so then they risk, you know, what they were risking. They were willing to go ahead and act based on this idea that there's something God is working here. And so they risk and hid the child. And isn't it, a, I mean, you know, a whole other story, but just what a, you know, when you look how God works in things, 
You know, my brother John likes to tell the, this story about, you know, this little baby in this basket. This, this, you know, vulnerable little child that the world looks at and says, there's no power, there's nothing here. God says, I got something for you. I'm doing something. And then you look at a cross where you see mankind where all the world would look and say that's absolute, utter defeat. Vanquished by the powers. And what is it? It's God's victory. God says, listen, I got something for you. Okay, but anyway, they, they wind up, they, they hide Moses, they have this insight. It says, by faith, Moses chose to identify with the people of God and thus to share in their mistreatment rather than to enjoy the temporary luxury and prestige that could have been his if he had sinfully ignored the plight of the Jews and identified with Pharaoh's house. I mean, he's raised in Pharaoh's house. You can see the temptation. I mean, there's an awful lot of stuff that comes with being in Pharaoh's house. And he could have just sinfully ignored the plight of the Jews, identified with Pharaoh's house, but he chose not to. He chose to identify with the people of God, and in doing so, he considered the reproach of the Christ the hardship and the contempt that he, like Christ, chose to suffer through identification with the people of God. See, it's the reproach of the Christ and that it's the same reproach he suffered in coming to bless the people, identify with the people of God. And that's what Moses chose to do. He came and identified with the people of God rather than with all the treasures and luxuries that he could have had as a son of Egypt. And he had that perspective, see, because his eyes were focused on the eternal reward that comes only to the faithful of God. Okay? Looking ahead, understanding, trusting, believing, and not just saying it. Down here. I know this is true. I heard that bell. Thank you for coming.